Jacqueline, Jackie, Cochran. The day I got my pilot's license, 
a beauty operator ceased to exist and an aviator was born. <laughs> now, when we teach the wasp how to fly, we have 75 different kinds of planes that we can fly around in for free. But I soon learned that flying was an expensive hobby. I also learned that a good way to make money was to enter and win air races. I entered the McRobertson race. You may recall us from London to Melbourne. And I entered the Bendix race many times. I was even fortunate enough to win in 1938. You know, I remember the first time I entered that race. I was driving in my car one day, and I saw a flyer taped to a telephone pole. Now it looked mighty interesting, so I pulled over to look at it. Become a star and win $30,000, it said. Enter the 1935 Trophy Bendix Race. Entry forms below. And there was just a box of entry forms sitting there. I can become a star and win $30,000? It seemed like just my cup of tea. <laughs> so I picked up the pill full of entry forms and got back in my car. Now, filling out these entry forms was a nightmare, especially since I only went to the second grade. But I did finish and I took them down to the local airport to turn them in. Now, once I walked into the building, I saw a man sitting at a desk in the corner. And I figured I could ask him where I'd turn in my form. So I marched right up to him. And I said, Sir, where do I turn in my entry form? And he looked at me. What is your form? He asked. So I showed him my form and said, My entry form, my Bendix entry form, where do I turn it in? Oh, he said. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am, but women aren't allowed to enter the Bendix. What? I wasn't allowed to enter the Bendix based on my gender? That wasn't fair. So I looked him right in the eye, and I said, Sir, if you exclude me from this race, women may be barred from racing for years, maybe even forever. And I walked out. But I left my entry form there on purpose. A couple days later, I got a phone call, and it was the attendant. He said, Miss Cochran, are you still interested in entering the Bendix? Now the Bendix is the most prestigious air race in the world. It's hard even when it has clear skies outside. So I started practicing every day. I had day flying, night flying, blind landings for months until finally I was ready. Now, the Bendix goes from Los Angeles, California to Cleveland, Ohio. So the race starts in the middle of the night. I was set to go up at about 12.30, but I had to be delayed till 2.30. After hours of waiting and waiting and waiting, it was the guy in front of me's turn to go up. I met him, actually. It was his first air race. And frankly, I had never seen anyone more proud. So he jumped into his little airplane, waved at me, and took off into the night. Now, there was pea soup fog out there. After a couple of minutes, I couldn't see him anymore. 
until I saw an explosion in the sky. A fire truck and an ambulance whizzed right by me. So I jumped into my car to see where it happened. His plane had exploded. He hadn't survived. Suddenly I wasn't so sure about this. What if that happened to me? But I didn't want them to think I was scared. Oh, no. So I walked into the local diner and bought myself a bowl of chili. While I was eating, a man came in and asked me if I was entering the race. And when I said yes, he said, You can't go out there. You'll kill yourself. It's suicide. I'll come back to haunt you, was my reply. Everybody in the diner started to laugh. And I felt a little bit better. But I still wasn't so sure about this. So I called my husband Floyd on a payphone. The moment he picked up, I said, Floyd, the guy in front of me explodes. What do I do? <laughs> he started to laugh. But he soon realized this was no laughing matter. We talked for a minute, and finally he said, Jackie, there's a difference between doing something based on logic and doing something based on instinct. And he hung up. It took a moment for his words to sink in, but I knew what I had to do. But the instant I got inside my cockpit, I realized I was leaving with nothing more than a soda bottle filled half pile with soda and some lollipops in my jumpsuit pocket. This was no time to be thinking about food or drink. Now, at the end of the runway, they had this white picket fence. It would have been a miracle if I could clear it. Slowly, I started to inch down the runway, and the fire truck and an ambulance right behind me. <laughs> I didn't have to do this. I could turn around right now, but I didn't. So I shut my eyes tight and jerked back on the stick. I found out later that there had been a wire on the belly of my plane that had been ripped off by the picket fence. But other than that, I was okay. I looked around. I was flying. I, a woman, was flying in the Bendix. After a couple of hours, I reached the Grand Canyon. And I looked ahead of me, and I saw electrical storms. I thought of Floyd's words again. There's a difference between doing something based on logic and doing something based on instinct. Now, when I had left that airport, I had been doing it based on instinct. But it was not logical to fly through that electrical storm. So I turned right around and went back to the airport. And once I got there, I was greeted by reporters. And they asked me, are you all right if something happened? Did a male pilot threaten you? I just said I got tired and quit. It didn't matter so much anymore. I could always enter again. Gosh, all this cross-country flying Right until the first time I ever flew cross country. It was about two days after I got my pilot's license, and we heard there was going to be an air mate in Montreal. Now, when we teach the wasp to fly, we teach them how to read maps, identifying checkpoints, compass navigation, and radio ranging. When I learned to fly, I didn't know any of that. All I knew was, 
You push the stick forward, the cows get bigger. You push the stick back, the cows get smaller. <laughs> and I think that's how I learned to fly in only three days. <laughs> well, anyway, we heard there that all the best flyers were going to be at the ceremony. So I decided to go. But I had two problems. Number one, I had no idea how you got to Montreal. And number two, I didn't have a plane. <laughs> now out on the airfield, there was this man named M. E. Grebenberg. Everybody called him Grebby. So I marched right up to him. I, I didn't know anything about it. All I knew was his name was Grabby, and he had a fair child, 22. So I walked right up to him, and I said, Grabby, that's a nice plane you got. I'll be fixing to buy it. Then he asked me about my flying experience. And I had to admit that my pilot's license was only two days old. <laughs> Then he asked me if I'd done any cross-country flying to back up the license. And I had to say no. This is crazy, he said. You can't go to Canada alone. I'm going with you. No, I said. I'm going to Canada alone. I want to. Now, we debated this for some time. Until finally he said, fine. I'll give you the plane on one condition. Its original price when it was brand new, $2,000. And it took me a while, about an hour or so, but I came up with the money and he gave me the plane. Then I met an old conjurer who knew the way to Montreal and gave me detailed instructions. Well, the HUD follow the Hudson River to Lake Champlain. Once there, land at the airport and ask for directions. <laughs> <laughs> so, with my maps in hand, hand, which I really didn't know how to read, I left. And I did exactly as, I, as he said. I followed the Hudson River, reached Lake Champlain, landing, and they brought up the attendant. As I saw him coming, I said, Sir, do you know the way to Montreal? <laughs> he didn't believe me. See, I'd been flying from Long Island. And he figured that all the Americans came from New York, and they knew the way to Montreal. So he laughed and said, you must be kidding. I wouldn't be kidding if I asked you, I said. And that wiped the smirk off his face. So then he began to explain the checkpoints and the radio ranging and the navigation on the compass. It was like listening to French. <laughs> so finally I said, Sir? I don't know how to read a compass. And this time, he really didn't believe me. So he walked back into the airport and left me in my wonder. And a couple minutes later, he came out with a few strong men and ordered them to push my plane around in circles. The space still inside. Then he told me to look at my compass. Apparently, the red needle always points forth, no matter what direction you're in. <laughs> and that was my introduction to compass navigation. <laughs> <laughs> now once all this was done, I jumped out of the plane and thank you. It was a windy day and I almost got knocked down. But I didn't care. So I held out my hand and said, thank you. He looked at me in a strange way. But then I went back to the airport. Now that I 
way to Mon the way to Montreal, I flew the rest of the way there. And once I landed on the airfield, I pulled my compact out of my purse and ah, oh, I was a mess. <laughs> now I knew why the attendant was smiling. My hair was windblown and my makeup was smudged. So I reached into my purse and pulled out a new tube of lipstick. And you know what? To this day, I never leave the cockpit without freshening my makeup first. <laughs> well, I think I've taken up enough of your time in this lovely town of Reno. And I was just thinking, with all this wide open space, this would be an ideal place for an air race. <laughs> you might want to consider that. <laughs> well, we're going to win this war, ladies and gentlemen. Please support our fighting men before you leave tonight by buying more hats. Thank you. Questions for Jackie Cochran, right here. What was the name of your cosmetic company and what happened to it? What was the name of your cosmetic company and uh, how's business? Well, my company is called Jacqueline Cochran Cosmetics. And I'd like to ask the woman next to you, ma'am, what cosmetics do you buy? <laughs> <laughs> I've created this new product called the Perk Up Cylinder. And it's about three inches high, and it has a mirror, lipstick, and perfume, all in this little tube. It's perfect for the traveling business world. I myself use it on a couple of my flights. I'm sorry, Miss Cocker, we don't allow commercials in Do we, do we do we have some uh, do we have some other questions yeah. for, for our great pilot friend here? Yes, and I'll go to the back. Yes, where did the wasp girls get their training? Well, where where were the wasps trained? Huh? Do you want to know what the army called it or what the wasp called it? <laughs> Let's do both. Well, the army called it Avenger Field, Sweetwater, Texas. Now. They have heat and dust and snakes and spiders and scorpions. And that's where we train our wasps. It was the perfect place. In fact, the ladies have to shake their boots out in the morning to make sure there isn't a spider or a snake living in there. Oh. I said before that the Army called the training base Avenger Field. Now, I'm not supposed to, co to know this, but the Wasp called it Cochran's Convent. <laughs> <laughs> I just uh, read an article recently that said the reason why God created men was to kill spiders for women. But, uh, I just thought I'd, uh, I'd, I'd add that. I have a question back here. Yes, sir. Did you ever meet Amelia Earhart? Uh, that, this is a good question. Did you ever uh, Did you ever meet Amelia Earhart? Yeah. A Kansas girl, I might add. <laughs> Amelia. She's one of my best friends. And I would like to clarify something. Now, there are some people here who think that on Amelia's last flight, she was going on a spy mission for the U.S. Well, if it was a spy mission, it was probably the most bumble of spy mission ever to talk to. Well, that wouldn't be unusual for our government. <laughs> you see, Information is useless unless you receive it. Now, Amelia is going from this big landmass of New Guinea over the truck islands 
to Hawaii. A tip hat to this little spot in the middle of the ocean called Holland Island, and then on to Hawaii. Now, if this really was a spy mission, wouldn't it make more sense to go from Hawaii to Howland, to Truk, to New Guinea? See, New Guinea is this big landmass, and you can see it from anywhere, with less than perfect navigation, with less than perfect weather. And another thing, Howland is in the middle of the ocean. You can barely find it. Now, if she had left from Hawaii and couldn't find Howland, she had plenty enough fuel to turn around and go back. Now, when she went, now when she went from New Guinea to truck to Howland, she didn't have that luxury. I don't think it was a spy mission. Actually, I think that it was one of her husband George Putnam's publicity stunts. Oh. <laughs> Let's see. You have maybe one more question in the clear in the back here. Yes, ma'am. Did Did you wear the same uniforms as the men did in the military? The question is, did you wear the same uniform as men did in the military? Yeah. Actually, in the beginning, the army didn't even want us to have uniforms. But I insisted that we would. <coughs> so, the army wanted us to wear black uniforms. Well, we were black. And I didn't want my ladies wearing some cast-off uniforms that I think are made of the same material they make tents out of. <laughs> <laughs> so I hired a couple of designers in New York to design the uniform, and I showed it to the Army. Well, I kind of cheated a little bit on this. See, I hired just an ordinary woman to wear the wax uniform. And I hired a beautiful New York model to model our uniform. <laughs> Guess which one the army picked. <laughs> <laughs> would, would you welcome, please, Nicole Pachaki? Nicole is a uh, sixth grader at the Rollin Melton Elementary School, and of course we know that Rollin Melton was a great supporter of Nevada Humanities and uh, one of the great uh, journalists and writers uh, from this area, and his wife Marilyn also was a great supporter, so I think that's appropriate. This is your second year in Chautauqua, young Chautauqua. Are there some questions uh, for Nicole? as the uh, person, the scholar behind uh, Jackie Cochran. Yes, right here. I'm just wondering if she could tell us a little bit about all her awards and what she won. You're, you're talking about Jackie. if Nicole could tell us about the awards Jackie Cochran has won. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the records and awards of uh, Jackie Cochran? Well, when she died, she had won more, she won the record for more world records set by any other pilot, male or female, in history. Wow. <laughs> and she still holds that record. Oh, wow. Um, she set lots of records like first woman to fly a bomber across the Atlantic Ocean and first woman to break the sound barrier. She won the she won the Businesswoman of, um, Business of the Year Award twice in a row. And she won the Distinguished Service Medal after the war. Mm -hmm. really, and she was a Lieutenant Colonel in the Reserve, too. Mm -hmm. That's quite a, quite a record. Yeah. <laughs> Question back here for Nicole. You're talking about uh, 
Oh, how much education did Jackie Cochran actually have? Uh, what kind of education did Jackie Cochran have? Well, um, from six years old she started first grade, and after about three days, the teacher whipped her with a ruler, and she can't remember why, but she remembered it wasn't fair, so she hit the teacher back and left the school. <laughs> Thank you. 